Welcome to the Unlicensed Podcast. We've got Caleb, who is me. Uh, we got Tassos over here, as always. Say hi, Tassos. Hi. And we're back for 2024 on this gloomy, dark January day. So uh, this week we're super excited. We've got Daniel White and Veronica Perrin from Atheral. Or Atheral, or whatever. We can discuss that here shortly. So. <laughs> But uh, we're going to talk about VoIP, uh, and it's something that uh, I don't have a lot of experience with. You know, I'm familiar with what VoIP is, but, you know, there's a lot of the technical side, there's regulatory stuff, and how you really integrate that uh, into a WISP business is, is kind of a, a, you know, a new kind of topic for me. So we're going to talk to Daniel and Veronica. They've been doing this for quite a while. Uh, a lot of you guys know Daniel. So before we hop into that conversation, though, real quick, toss those, if you'll give the good people out there their call to action. Absolutely. Don't forget to like, listen, and subscribe to our channel right here on YouTube or anywhere you download your audio podcast like Apple, Google, or Spotify. Okay, that's the music playset. <laughs> All right. So let's get to it, guys. So like I said, we've got Daniel White and Barack Aparin from Atheral. So Guys, great. Uh, we super appreciate you guys joining us here today. Uh, get yeah, us some education here. For sure, for sure. So a lot of y'all know Daniel. I mean, Daniel's been around forever. Um, a lot of y'all know him. He's been a Wispa. Yeah, 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 exactly, right? I can see my, my little wings are kicking in here. But uh, <laughs> if you two just uh, give a kind of a quick history, you know, with re relation to... You know, not just how you got into VoIP, where you decided to run with this business, but I guess about the, your your WIS background as a whole, and uh, let you know, let folks know where you're coming from. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so I got into the WIS space in 2006 as an installer for a, a local WISP in Colorado uh, called Mesa Networks. Uh, later got acquired by Jab and became Rise Brabia. Um, when the WISP I worked for got sold, by then I was climbing towers and. You know, kind of doing all the fun RF stuff. Um, I got offered to kind of go to an integration company for a bit. That kind of spurred into me working with some equipment manufacturers. I was a sales engineer for BridgeWave Communications. Uh, then became the director of North America for SAF Technica. So that's how a lot of people kind of got to know me. Millimeter Wave, license backhaul. Uh, after that, did a stint at uh, CTI Connect uh, as director of sales. And kind of during that period is when I discovered the need for VoIP, let's say. Um, you know, the, the WISP I worked for back in you know, 2006, 2007, we offered a VoIP product, but it was super basic and it didn't work well. You know, it was kind <laughs> of the bleeding edge of the technology back then. Um, then we kind of came around to CAF2. Uh, I was working at CTI Connect, kind of do my, my sales management type job, asking ISPs like, are you going for this or, uh, or not, you know, and, and what's stopping you? What are the barriers to you getting CAF2 funds or, or protecting your service area? And VoIP was the number one answer across the board. Either they didn't know how to do it and they didn't want to learn how to do it, or they were afraid of the regulation, or they tried working with companies before that didn't treat them well because they're a WISP. And, you know, they thought that they're, you know, substandard ISP, VoIP can't work on wireless equipment, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, when I left CTI Connect, um, I started this company and it's been five exciting years since. <laughs> what you, Veronica? Oh, geez. Um, not as long as you. <laughs> um, I started off working for a small ISP in uh, Oregon called Budget Internet. Uh, and then from there, I worked with Visp for a few years and uh, then Wispa and then Trang. Oh, I'm, I feel like I'm missing something. Trango. And then I did my own consulting for about a year or so. And then uh, I had a tiny, tiny little uh, time where I didn't work in the in the WISP industry. I worked for an MSP out of Washington. And then Daniel picked me up a year into Ethereal. And I've been with them ever since. Yeah. So, yeah, I love our, our family, our community we have here. So, Ew. Yeah. 
the history goes way back. I mean, I totally forgot. I mean, I've known Daniel uh, for quite some time now, and uh, I totally forgot that you came from Bridgewave. I mean, geez, it's like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I forget too. Yeah, that was uh, 2010 when I started yeah. Bridgewave. So, exactly. yeah, it's been a minute. Um, and you mentioned, you know, Wispa, like I've served on the board of directors for Wispa. Yeah. Uh, three times now, off and on, off and on type thing. So uh, I just finished up a, a three-year term and, and some change. So yeah, I've been around for a while. Um, kind of funny to think that when I, I got in the industry in 2006, like I was looking around, a lot of guys been doing it for like five years, right? Like the Matt Larson's out there like, oh man, these are the old school guys, you know, the, the goats, right? And now people look at me like, oh man, you've been doing this a decade more than me. Like, Ah, yeah. 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 Time's where's, where's your white hair? How come you don't have any grays, dude? Yeah, there's some in the back here. <laughs> <Yeah>, four years. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, I um, that's like one of the greatest uses of my LinkedIn profile. Like, I keep it up to date just so I can track the history. It starts getting a little fuzzy yeah. in yeah. the back. You're yeah. like, wait, yeah. when did <laughs> I ever have to fill anything out or something? So, yeah. Uh, well, very cool. So, you know, you've been doing this a while. You've seen a lot of change across the industry, obviously. So, you know, I remember way back in the day when people are like, we're going to, we're going to do VoIP over the network. So like, man, do, yeah. do these radios, these APs and CPEs, can they sustain the packet count to handle VoIP? Yeah. Like that was yeah. a big <laughs> thing for a period, you know, we're like, oh yeah, this radio can do 50,000 packets per second. It's amazing. So we can do VoIP. Yeah. So the, the tech is definitely, uh, progressed significantly. So it's feasible to do it in a lot of different places where, you know, you couldn't do it 10, 15 years ago. So definitely not, you know, uh, with, with you being kind of the, the, the subject matter expert here for sure. Um, you know, kind of tell us about, you know, where, where VoIP, where does it fall into modern networks now or modern ISPs? Uh, I mean, we can look at the tech perspective. We could look at the, the business case, regulatory, sure. uh, like that part with CAF, like I wasn't even aware of that. Me neither. You know, I was just like, okay. Offering, so. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, the, I didn't need to cut you off, uh, the CAF 2 and ARDOF, right? So those two programs were funded by the federal universal service fund. So if you look mm -hmm. at any telephone bill. Um, cell phone, whatever else, there's going to be a line item charge on there that says Federal Universal Service Fund or FUSF. Um, it could just say USF. But that fund has been around, gee, I think since like the 30s or 40s. And yeah. the idea is that uh, telephone subscribers subsidize telephone companies to build telephone service to people that otherwise wouldn't get served, right? So we all know those use cases where there's somebody to live in the middle of nowhere. It's going to cost $30,000 to build fiber or whatever to them. Um, there's no way a telephone company can make that profitable. So FUSF steps in to reimburse, say, that telephone company historically to do that. Um, with CAF2, uh, the FCC kind of said, well, hey, we have all this money over here and connecting people by telephone really isn't a problem anymore. You know, pretty much the entire United States has it. Yes, there's some high cost areas, but internet's more important. So we can give this money away to build internet, but because it came from this telephone kind of slush fund, let's say, uh, there had to be a telephone aspect to it. So to protect your service area, it was 25 by three, and you, you had to uh, be able to provide telephone service, which meant you had to be the carrier of record, uh, reselling someone else's boy product where you didn't do any of the regulatory work and you just got like a cut of the commission or something that didn't count. You know, if your subscribers went and bought Vonage on their own or something, that doesn't count. Uh, you actually have to be the carrier of record. Uh, and, and so obviously for ISPs that leads into VoIP, um, that's the easiest way to do it. No one wants to put copper lines in the ground anymore. Um, and, and so that meant a lot of ISPs had the capability of, if they met the 25 by three, which a lot did and do, um, VoIP was the aspect that they were either missing to protect their area from overbuilding or um, to actually go after funds. Uh, and then after CAF2 was RDOF, took from the same slush fund, let's say. Um, now with the... Uh, 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 all the kind of newer stuff that Congress has passed, states are passing, um, stuff like bead, voice isn't necessarily required anymore. 
um, because it's not coming from that universal service fund. Uh, but what we're finding more now is that expanding into super rural areas, people still want telephone service or yeah. the, the bigger use case or the bigger business case for it. It's actually businesses. Um, ISPs that, that do serve businesses tend to have uh, a lot of uptake in the VoIP aspect because uh, at the same time, VoIP is kind of becoming, has become more prevalent. Um, a lot of the copper, you know, the frontiers of the world are actually discontinuing service, right? They're, they're trying to get rid of their copper plant. Uh, and I've seen people come to us uh, or through their ISPs that have phone bills are a couple hundred a month and now they're like 1200 a month because they're just trying to price people to get off the system. So yeah, that's kind of the, the, the why, I mean, how I got into it was just, you know, going around to some of the really big ISPs that everybody knows, like they weren't going to even bother protecting their service area because WIP was this big, scary thing in the closet. And it really isn't anymore. Um, when you, you, you mentioned packets per second and stuff, that, I mean, that's funny. I haven't thought about that a long right. time. Radio is that <laughs> yeah. like, oh, we're focused on packets per second. They're like, wow, this one has more. Um, and that's kind of a big reflection on why VoIP isn't a big, as big of a deal anymore. Um, you know, uh, an uncompressed kind of weight stream, about 100 kilobits. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back when you were selling one and a half make plans, that 2006, that was the most common package we sold. And you've got an access point that can do 14 meg aggregate. Uh, every voice call taking up 100 kilobytes upload and download. Uh, that was a lot of bandwidth. <laughs> yeah. So um, really the, one of the biggest things I think that's enabled Ethereal to really come into its own. Um, not only was that CAF2, but the bandwidth requirements that consumers have has gone up so much. That 100 kilobit stream is nothing now. Um really isn't required any real traffic engineering anymore uh, for VoIP where before, oh, it required a ton. You know, you really had to yeah. worry about QoS and, and everything else. So Yeah, I remember. I remember having to prioritize it, you know, over other traffic and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's come a long way since setting up a Trix box and, you know, or yeah. or, se or setting up like some Vonage or Packet eight ATAs on your network, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, it's definitely a completely different beast now and um I, I think probably the number one thing people tell me is like well is it we dying is it dead and it's it, it's no. not it's, I, it's, it's funny yeah. <laughs> i so i mean i i mean there's just something it's it's not necessarily voip but i think it's the legacy of having a home phone of some sort i mean i i have yeah. bondage at my house and i've had it for since 2004, basically, when I got into this industry, that was one of the first things I tried to do. I tried to go into MDUs and I had to do the triple play, right? So I had to have some sort of voice to offer, some sort of video, and then, of course, internet on top of that. And I've had the same Vonage line since 2004. It cost me like whatever, 20 bucks a month. And it's just, it's it's nice just having it there. And I know if an emergency happens, I pick up and dial 911, they know exactly where to come. You know, you don't have to say where you're at. So there's there's some comfort to that that you, at least I don't get, you know, with a cell phone as the, the primary only, you know, system. So it's, it's yeah, important, it, I think. Actually, residential, wait, that's the number. Besides the, hey, I just like having, you know, an analog or a pot slide type yeah. thing, or I'm 80 years old, I've always had it, I'm going to have it. Um, the, the 911 aspect is probably where we see a lot of people do it. And it's for young families. I mean, did you guys yeah. ever see that, uh, that TikTok that was going around where someone was like, man, I, I wish there was a way that we could have this phone at home and we never had to worry about the battery dying and yeah. you know, all, you know, all these things like, yeah, that's a phone line, right? Yeah, like, exactly. Uh, yeah. And, and, and one of those big aspects is like, you have a three-year-old kid, right? I mean, we were all kids. We've all had kids, right? You, you, you teach them about 911. Well, that's great. But now with everything being a cell phone, like, well, where is the cell phone, right? Yeah. Oh, it's in mommy's pocket. She fell over and now you can't get it out. Yeah. Uh, Something. Yeah. So we, we actually see uh, young families, a lot of young families actually long avoid just for 911, uh, um, which was something I never expected getting into this. Uh, well, 
my parents, my parents do it because their cell phone coverage is, you know, if you go to the front of the house on the Porsche, it works fine, but it's shaky in yeah. the back and then the yeah. back bedroom, you know, it doesn't really work. So they're older and, you know, if they fall or something in the bedroom, they're, they're in a bind. So they've always got their 1980s cordless phone back there that lasts <laughs> like three weeks without charging it yeah. up and everything else. So yeah, yeah it makes, makes a ton of sense from a residential perspective and you're out of band and, you know, it's one of your final lifelines. So. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It, you know, and that's, you, you know, kind of that so rural that there's no cell phone coverage. I was shocked, honestly, when, when I started this company that that was still really a thing. You know, a lot of cell phones, okay, they can connect Wi-Fi or you can get boosters or whatever else. But I would say that's probably the other kind of big residential play, right, is people are so rural where WISPs typically live, right, that... Uh, there is no cell phone coverage. So they still want that landline at home. Uh, I'll be the first one to admit though, it's it's dying, right? I mean, the FCC sure. stats alone show that voice lines are residential declining. Um, but that's really where we see, I think our, our most successful customer or resellers, our clients, uh, are ISPs that focus on businesses uh, because that's really where there's still a lot of growth um, globally because there's still 30 year old PBXs I mean, they're finally dying. <laughs> so stuff yeah. needs to Yes. Be. And uh, they can all die as far as I'm concerned. I never, <laughs> oh, yeah. the last time I set up an analog PVX, I'm like, I'm going to blow my brains out and go yeah. work on a shrimp boat. But, um, yeah. you know, void management makes it so much easier. And especially if you're in a dynamic environment in the business where you've got things like phone queues, right? And automated attendance. Like, it's just so much easier to manage when you can go to some web portal somewhere and just do everything from that. It's just, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. advancements for sure. No programming the buttons on the phone. It was, yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> the player profile or something. Yeah. You're like, yeah. we're, yeah. we're living in the future. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, there's cool things too. Like, hey, you got a VoIP system. You can literally pick the phone up off your desk, take it home with you, plug it in, and it should work. You know, like, it's, sure. uh, I mean, yeah, we've, you know, there's always all sorts of apps, right? That, you know, you can have on your cell phone or your computer to do, to act like you're at your void phone, but there's something nice about being able to pick up the phone and, and just move it and it works. Uh, uh, you know, that, that we saw a lot during COVID, which was, uh, I guess a, a good time for us to be in this phase. Yeah, yeah. 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 Cause people, people wanted to take their office phones home with them and it not be hardwired to a PBX. Right. So it, I it like works. it's just phones. Some people like the cell phones, but I like, I have a physical phone on my desk. I use that more than I use my, the app on my cell phone. Yeah. Yeah. I liked, I like the soft phone aspect of it and being able to port, port that number to my cell phone and use it anywhere as well. And, yeah. And, I mean, it's just, yeah, what you can do with just it is, is pretty awesome. Well, and it really plays into, you know, the, with that focus on business, you know, you always want to to get more than just the internet service, right? The more yes. services you can provide the stick here. And it's from a customer service perspective where most WIS, you know, really excel or, or excel at, you know, it's, it's good to have a, a phone partner that is easy for them to work with and the end user too. So like when I was at Doves during COVID, we had to change around our whole, you know, phone cues and stuff because everyone went to home. We had like, I don't know, a three day heads up. Right. So right. You know, we were, we had a good VoIP partner and they were like, you know, here's how you push the profiles remote, all the authentication and everything. And it worked beautifully, but yeah. in the course of like a day, like our whole sales team and most of the office, everyone could work from home, but from their perspective, they're just picking up the phone and pounding and like I everywhere, mean, you know, like a day to day thing. So it, yeah. it really plays into the the customer service side. I think is really important, rather than having to rely on you know some evil big telco or some fly by night thing. And you know, with you guys especially, because you understand the WISP market and the you know the the customers that you're working with, like you know how they do business, you understand them. So it makes it easier for you to to provide services or you know know how they're thinking, which is really important because if you just go with Joe Bob's MSP VoIP service, you know you, you never really know what you're getting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and I mean that's kind of the reason why I started the company, right? Is that there of the the wisps I talked to, right? A lot the ones that had tried working with a a partner like us. Um, they're focused on MSPs, right? And the MSP VoIP market 
is huge. Uh, yeah. If you look at the profiles of almost any wide label weight company, um, they almost always focus on MSPs because there's there's far more MSPs out there than ISPs. Uh, you know, when you think of the biggest ISPs in the nation, they all have their own VoIP engineers, VoIP departments and stuff. And just like Wisp experience in so many other places, like we get forgotten, right? And, um, and, and so I wasn't afraid of the technology. I knew it worked great, but a lot of these other MSP centric companies are like, oh, it's like cable, it's not fiber. It's not going to work. And it's just not the case, right? Uh, uh, it works great over wireless. Um, and you know, 15 years ago, it was a little bit more of a crapshoot, but now with the equipment we got today, oh, it's, it's just butter. It's so simple. <laughs> the equipment is yeah. better. The traffic shaping and queuing QOE, like there's a lot of these things. So now you mentioned, uh, one point here, let's loop back a little bit. So you mentioned being a carrier of record, right? So, um, so, you know, there's being that, which seems important. Um, or like reselling services and stuff like that. Like, so I'm a wisp and I want to start offering phone service. Like what are in general, like the ways I can do it, like resell, or if I'm a carrier of record or something like, what does that mean yeah. from a, I guess, regulatory perspective and things like that? Like, what does that mean? Yeah. So there's really, if you're an ISP, there's really three ways you can kind of become a void provider. Uh, the first one would be to resell somebody else's service. So um, there are companies that will say, uh, offer VoIP, you know, VoIP to your customer. We'll give you a percentage of the profit. We build them. We handle the regulatory stuff. They're our customer, but we give you like a commission every month, right? That's the easiest way to do it, right? You don't, you don't pull any of the baggage, but you also can't provide any of the support. You don't own the customer. All you've done is kind of like earn a sales commission. So uh, it, it's the easiest way to get into it, but it's also the most limiting as far as being able to provide customer support and whatnot. Um, the second way in, which is kind of where we fall, is white label VoIP. So what white label VoIP means is that you're the carrier, it's your customer, you set the pricing, um, you maintain that relationship. Uh, we do all the hard work on the back end. So we run the servers, we provide you support, um, we try to make it really simple for you to support your customer and to offer it as a service. The downside to it um, is the regulatory aspect. Um, you do have to file some paperwork, depending on the state with your, your state, um, you're gonna have to file some paperwork with the FCC. None of it is super complicated unless, I mean, California and New York being California and New York are probably the most complicated. Uh, right. But even though we've got actually a number of ISPs in California and New York that, that do it. So uh, there's, there's a lot of really good consultants out there that will handle the regulatory aspect for it, for you. Um, uh, and a few we can recommend. Uh, there's also easily the capability for you to do it yourself. Depending on the state, it's not that bad. Um, the third way then is to just do it all yourself, which means you stand up the servers, you buy all the minutes, uh, you're the, you know, the expert, um, you do it all right. And, and there's no one behind you to, to back you up. Um, when, when I started the company, I, I went for option two, primarily for, uh, for two reasons. One, it, you can qualify for all the CAF to art off, like. You become the carrier, so it makes the FCC happy. Um, and, and the second reason white label to me sounded really appealing is that most ISPs don't have the the budget, the staff, the time, the desire to become a VoIP engineer. Um, there, there's kind of one aspect of engineering VoIP where like you can kind of get a feel for it within I don't know, a year if you do a day in and a day out, and you kind of understand it, but to really understand VoIP, there's like a whole nother level where it takes years and years of just, that's all you do. Um, I don't even consider myself the technical expert in this company. Um, <laughs> we've There's always been a counterpart to me that's been the technical expert. Uh, and it took me probably a good three or four years of doing this day in and day out before like I really felt like I knew it. Um, so instead of hiring a VoIP engineer, number two works great. And... Um, 
we've we've actually had a lot of ISPs turn down their own systems just for that reason is that they don't want to maintain it, right? Um, they just want to sell it, do the basic support. They want to bill for it, check the boxes with the FCC, um, and 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 focus on what they're good at, right? Which is is typically building networks, um, not necessarily some of the value adds that you can add on top of it. Okay. And that makes a lot of sense, right? Like there's only, there's only so much time in a day and you can only be an expert in so many things. Right. So, yeah. you know, and, and like any other business to business thing, it's really where, where it scales in and, you know, uh, improving your operational efficiencies and everything like that. Oh, yeah. Um, and having someone else to yell at when the fun doesn't work is kind of <laughs> handy yeah, too, definitely. right? So oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, you never got an angry phone call or so fun. <laughs> no, they couldn't. The phone was broke. So, yeah. um, no, that was, okay. that was always in my, my MSP world and stuff like that. Like the, the phone was always like the, the touchiest subject. Right. So, I mean, obviously if their internet goes down, that's a bad thing, but yeah, like phones going down is just as bad, but it seems like it gets ramped up you know, tenfold. Right. So, yes. yeah. Yeah. And you know, the nice thing is that we, we do the, you know, the ISPs are the, the first line of defense for us. Right. So we don't, we don't actually speak to your end users. They don't know we exist. Uh, so we don't get necessarily sometimes those initial calls, right. Of it, it's broken. Um, but the nice about VoIP is that it, if, if it's set up correctly and it's managed on the back end really, really well, um, it doesn't really break that off. It just works. Yeah. yeah um, As it should. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and I think if, if I think of anything that maybe separates us from, from some of the MSP type shops that, that do VoIP or uh, white label MSP shops is that we've collectively, the, what, what I would consider like the, the management team, the company, including Dustin Cortez, who is with us today on the call, um, we've all worked for WISPs. Like we've all hey. been the guy that's been screamed at or had to think about doing a tower climb, uh, you know, Christmas Eve in a blizzard. Uh, we've been there. We've done that. <laughs> so um, one of the things a lot of people told me when I first started the company was that I was spending too much money on the infrastructure. Like, oh, you don't need to buy a new server. You could buy a 10 year old used server or, you know, you don't have to have your power design or your switch design this complicated. Like, you know, make it simpler. It's okay. Uh, and, and I've never wanted to be that guy. Like I've always engineered it as if I was still an ISP and I wanted to make sure I'm, you know, maximal redundancy and everything we did. So, um, fortunately, knock on wood, uh, outages are pretty rare, <laughs> just pure outages. Uh, I'm not going to say they've never happened, but, uh, super, super rare. We don't want to be the cause of that call. Uh, yeah. and, and. You know, so that's why I, I even uh, we have SLAs we provide with our service too, which surprisingly a lot of white, uh, just white companies in general don't put an SLA behind the service, which I've always thought is weird uh, because it is sometimes just as critical as an internet connection. You know, like yeah. I don't want to get that angry phone call, and neither do you. So yeah. So how does it how does it work? Like let's say you know the mechanics of setting up an account and, and, you know, white labeling a service. So I'm an ISP. I want to be the carrier of record. Like you said, yeah. I mean, is, the, I mean, the back end portal, I mean, do they have to contact you? They just pick a number, you know I mean? How, how does all that work for the sure. residential side? I know it's probably different for commercial a little bit, but I mean, how, how does that work in general? Well, so there's, there's two pieces, right? There's the onboarding phase, which, which Veronica is the, uh, the master of that's a big part of what she does here. Huh? Um, and then there's the, once you're onboarded kind of piece, right? So generally, uh, the way that somebody comes, comes to us as an initial phone call just says, Hey, I want to offer VoIP. Um, I always do those calls and, you know, kind of give them the guidance, wherever they're looking for, uh, but once they've decided to, to kind of take the plunge with us, the regulatory piece kind of happens outside of us, right? Because we don't we don't do that piece, um, and I've always I've never wanted to offer that piece because what a lot of companies do is just resell someone else, right? And you know, there's there's plenty of analogs in in the WIS space of where you know and Kayla, but I mean, actually, Talos says you've done it too, right? But Titan, like you resell somebody else's service. I just didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be in the middle. 
Um, maybe because I'm lazy. I don't know. Uh, so we, uh, we usually point people to a couple different things. And that usually happens kind of in tandem with onboarding. Um, but the paperwork aspect, once again, it's not really that bad. So some ISPs just do it themselves. Um, then they come over to Veronica. Do you want to talk about onboarding? Onboarding? No. Okay. <laughs> onboarding simple. I love it. And it, I feel like it can be as simple as they want it to be and go as quickly as they want it to be. We've done onboardings in two or three days, I feel like. That's like an expedited one. A normal one takes about two weeks. Um, but then we've had some that take a little bit. And we understand that. They're, they're a wisp. Like, they have other things to do. We, we get it. So um, once they get to me, uh, that's where I uh, send them a board, a list of things to do. I project manage the entire process from start to finish. Um, that includes branding, um, branded items for them, even uh, like marketing items, flyers, branded portal, um, four hours of training with, with their engineering team, um, and then a bunch of resources, how to contact us, how to troubleshoot afterwards, how to, we have knowledge-based articles that they can go over and, and uh, read, and then if they need help, how to reach us. Um, and yeah, from there, we do quarterly follow-ups with all of our clients to make sure that they're happy and growing and yeah, I feel like from, yeah. So there's easy. Things, yeah, there's it's easy. We, we try to give you all the information up front, yeah. like kind of get you comfortable with us and the system. Um, but then we fully expect like the first time you sub customer, you're going to call us to like, help. Please, please call. Um, <laughs> what, is, how, what did you say I was supposed to click on? I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. We don't uh, expect them to remember everything for sure. We're human. <laughs> we get it. <laughs> uh, but once they're on board, uh, setting up a residential customer typically takes eh, five minutes. Um, there's, uh, if they don't have a phone number, there is a, in one of our portals, they can just order a phone number, uh, pick it for their city area code, whatever they want. Yeah. Um, but if they're going to bring in their own phone, phone number, um, it's called porting. Uh, that could typically, blah, 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 typically takes three to five business days. Uh, yeah. in, uh, in that time you need to provide a, a, a paper, uh, that the customer signed and we provide a branded version of this. So it'll have the, the WISPs logo on it, whatever else, um, uh, just saying that we can do this. The ISP turns it in with a copy of the customer's phone bill. And then we do the rest of the work to port the phone number in. There's a lot of work in the background. Porting yeah. is a mystical beast and, uh, yeah, we're very yeah. good at it. Yeah, it used to, and it used to be more. It used to be more difficult, from what I remember, because people wouldn't want you to leave, so they try and keep your number. But now I think it's more of a, they have to let it go, right? So it should yes. be a little bit easier. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a there's actually a good fact seat on the FCC website about uh, number portability uh, that makes it very very clear. Like you know, they have to let you go. It doesn't matter if you owe money. It doesn't matter if you're still in contract. Like they have to port your phone number. Uh, providers can't hold on to it, um, which is is great. So the, there's a lot of automation now, but porting is still very difficult. Uh, we have our we have a whole department that just deals with number porting. Like there wow. are dedicated people here that just do number porting yeah. um, because it's time consuming and it's it's a pain. So that's not another thing that. If you haven't done it before, you're not familiar with it, you don't want to jump into learning it. Uh, that's why we do it. Yeah. Um, Plus, we have multiple carriers. I mean, if they did it on their own, they might only have yeah. one. There's different. Yeah, so uh, we, we always try to maximize uh, portability. Uh, a lot of vendors, well, you know, so behind us, right, there's vendors that are offering the trunking. And, and you could buy SIP trunking from companies like Whip Innovations, people may know, and yeah. tell it with, yeah, with .com, Telnex. I mean, there's a, there, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, a lot of companies like us, though, will only work with maybe one vendor, right? That's how you maximize your your costs and, uh, and everything else. But the problem is, is that you end up losing areas you can't port. So we actually work with four different vendors, which is, is weird. That's another thing I've gotten... Uh, kickback from over the years from people are like you're spending too much money you shouldn't be doing that but we but do it because alliance. yeah we want porting to be simple yeah. so we will make sure yeah. we can do it um, but then setting up the customer yeah, it takes a couple minutes so once you know what's going on with the phone number uh, I think it's like 10 clicks in our portal and, uh, and the customers configured and ready to go and then you just need to take a 
either a VoIP phone or an ETA, which just converts a VoIP to an analog phone that the customer may already have um, and install it in the house. That is typically as complicated as plugging in the power in an Ethernet cable into a switch or the, the router you're using. Um, Configuration-wise, you have to put in one config line inside the ETA uh, that points it to our provisioning server, and that's it. So uh, once, you, yeah, once you get good at it, it's a, you can have a residential customer up in the online in five minutes or less. Uh, businesses, as you said, or commercial accounts, there's no defined timeline because it depends on how many phones and users and how complicated they want to get and, and whatever. Um, but we're here either way. You know, it's a, uh, One of the things that actually probably most of our support tickets are on is you've got this really weird situation and we don't know how to replicate this like really old configuration. How do we do this? Um, so sometimes support is just about us getting creative to replicate things. But um, businesses could be their own, you know, uh, can of worms from all those old PBXs and, and the way they used to yeah. do different language, different things, just yeah. figure out how they want it to ring. Yeah. So now do you guys offer like virtualized PBXs? you know, through some portal or do you just handle the trunking and, and they pick it up from the local side? Yeah. So that's a great question. Cause there's really two kind of methodologies to offering VoIP, right? Um, so we're, we do it in the quote unquote, the cloud. Um, but the other way is that you can do a bunch of PBXs, right? So, uh, I think three CX might be one of the most popular, um, you could definitely do it with, with things like free PBX or asterisks. And you know, there's, there's, a whole bunch of them, like uh, Taos has mentioned Tricks Box before. That was an old, old version of Asterix. Yep. Um, you know, and, and you then deploy uh, a PBX, right, at each customer site. Um, and then you just do SIP trucking to each. Um, it's one methodology, but the problem is, is that you've got to manage all those PBXs. Um, and, you know, if you've got 100 business customers, you've got 100 PBXs. Right. Uh, that could be a pain. Right to to have to individually go in and manage and deal with the uh, firmware updates and whatever else. Uh, so we do a cloud approach. Um, now, when I say cloud, uh, it, it's more of a, a private cloud. Uh, we own all the servers. Um, they're in our racks inside the data centers. Um, so we're not like taking space off Amazon or something. And um, in we made everything is within our switch. So uh, we, as a, as a company, we use a company called NetSapiens. They used to exhibit a lot at Whisper and? shows, but they've, they've kind of grown past, I guess, what a lot of Wisps can afford. Uh, the, you know, they're, to get into it now, you're, you're spending probably about $100,000 on, on it. One node. Yeah, on, one, one node. node. Yeah. Um, so there's a substantial investment, which is kind of what we did. But the the beauty of it is that you don't have to worry about equipment on site anymore. Um, you deploy phones to the site, but there's no PBX. So we do all the trunking inside of our switch environment. There's a branded portal that the customers get, and then the ISP gets as well with different permissions. Uh, so it, it makes it that the ISP doesn't have to deploy anything on their network, doesn't have to worry about it. Um, we even have some ISPs that come to us and as they're expanding, sometimes they're able to get the business phone service before they can provide the internet. So if you want to run it over a cable company stuff or, you know, something else, like it, it works. Um, you know, the, the ISP aspect doesn't really matter um, until it troubleshooting. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Like firewalls, yeah. Other unknown <laughs> things that you can't control now. Yeah. I, yeah. The, I, some of the ISPs out there that we've we've had to interact with, not our customers, but like they sell VoIP to a company that's not on their service. Um, sometimes they've just got the most com convoluted network designs and there's nothing we could do to fix it. But I think that also is, is the value of the ISP offering of VoIP is that they have a lot of control from point to point. Um, literally, we've got ISPs that are paired with us at the rack, right? Where they're in the same data center, cross-connected so it's like being on net um and it's it it's a thing of beauty we control everything end to end at that point and you can't get better than that for for a voice service uh so 
I, I really think there's a really good case for ISP software and, and how it can be superior to just putting over anybody's internet connection at, at, at that point. Yeah. How about the, uh, so the, the software side and the billing side of this stuff and more integration, like you guys uh, have your own just standalone portal and that's the way it works, or do you integrate with, let's say, PowerCode or other, other uh, you know, WISP management? Because we've, we've done a couple of uh, shows about that, but never how other services tie into those management softwares, you know? Yeah, so I think it, it, this is where Veronica has helped quite a bit with being with the company. She had a lot of billing background. Um, the The number one issue I think we've had is people come to us and say, are you integrated with X, Y, or Z? Right. Uh, and we ask, well, what do you mean by integration? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we've been kind of in this thing where we've talked to, VISP has actually been really good to talk to. Uh, I mean, we've talked to all the power code, sonar, uh, oh, Max. Bill yeah. Max, when the world will work. And the most integrated with us. I feel like. Yeah. Uh, it, it, there's like a willingness on both sides to, to do it, right? We, we've got a, a, a great API that they can use. Um, but when it comes down to it, uh, no one's really wanted to do it. And it, there really has a bit of push. So we haven't done it. Um, because when, when you think about telecom billing, right, uh, the average you know, bill or something would be typically it's like you've used a thousand minutes. So you owe us this much and you had 50 minutes of long distance and 10 minutes of international or whatever, because we don't sell the service that way. We sell it as unlimited local long distance and we include Mexico and Canada. We make it simple. Yeah. Kiss. Kiss is big. Uh, Over four values. Uh, Nobody really cares about the per minute billing. Yeah. So then it becomes, well, what are you actually billing for? And it's, uh, you bill per user. That's how we bill for it. Um, there could be an integration, but it, it seems like it's simple enough for people to just add that aspect uh, to their billing system. Now, the aspect that is really important is taxation. Um, and mm -hmm. I know I mentioned before, you got to work with the states, you got to work with the feds. Uh, federal USF has to get calculated per per user um but then a lot of states charge sales tax for phones so something maybe you don't deal with as an isp on your internet right but you have to deal with it on your voice service and sometimes the taxation can get a little complicated but the good news is that all the billing platforms typically uh offered integration with a platform like avalara for the taxation um so you know, we found that all the standard kind of list billing systems out there do actually a pretty good job. Uh, the only thing that's missing is maybe that link of, you know, how to link an account and are they active in our system or not. Uh, Logically, yeah. Yeah, it, but it, it doesn't seem like it's been a big deal for even our largest, our largest ISPs that they've just been able to kind of reconcile that themselves. So um, someday we'll, we'll do it. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, uh, pressure, I guess. You know, it seems like everyone's like, that's that's a great checkbox question, right? Yeah. But uh, when, it, when it comes out to it, no one's really pushed on, on any side for us to, to do it. So uh, it, it, it's there. Someday, maybe, um, we'll, we'll do it. We're not against it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's actually one of the things I was going to ask about, you know, is the the minutes, long distance, um, international, like a lot of this stuff you don't even really think about anymore. Right. So yep, you're like, right. Oh, my phone, I just yep. call, you know, once you get out of North America, I guess it gets more complicated, but it seems like simplifying yeah. it makes it, makes it a lot easier to deal with from a, a WISP perspective and a billing perspective too. Right. Like, like having a consistent bill. <laughs> yeah. And it's, and it's happening. I mean, uh, across multiple, uh, you know, different, uh, mechanisms like even my cell phone, right? I'm um, with T-Mobile, right? I, you know, when I was with AT&T, whenever I travel and I travel a lot internationally, I'd have to get like what they call the the passport thing, so that way I can get internet, yeah. right? Mobile data in other countries and tell them where I'm going. Now with T-Mobile, I get you know pretty much data, unlimited data anywhere. Now it's slow and crappy, but at least I have 
some sort of right. connectivity without having to pay above and beyond that. I get like unlimited SMS no matter where I am. So I can SMS in country, out of country. And it's it's pretty cool how that's all changing. I mean, if we look at how even cell phones started, you used to get X amount of minutes. VoIP was the same thing. I remember when they first said, now you have unlimited international to Canada and Mexico, right? That was the, the big, you know, the big thing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny how just, yeah, internet and this technology has, you know, really opened up so many things and it's, it's incredible what we can do and what it costs to do it now. Almost nothing. Yeah. It, you know, honestly, when I tell a lot of people too, like, especially for individuals, right. That want to talk to their friends and family in Japan or, you know, Greece or Turkey or I mean, China, we, we've gotten a lot of those type of requests. And like we can offer that international service and it's not a big deal, but honestly, especially internationally, a lot of people have like WhatsApp and, and all yeah. these other apps that just make it free. Um, that doesn't necessarily work for a business, but um, at the same time, in the business side, you've got Teams, you've got uh, Zoom or, or, you know, go to meeting. And so I, I, I find a lot of those international calls kind of happen there rather than on the phone. So, yeah, we don't really see a whole lot of demand outside of Canada and, and Mexico. So, you know, part of the reason why we just included it just makes it easy, you know. Exactly. Um, and that's and that's why I used to like my the soft phone aspect of VoIP because, again, I used to travel. So, I could call back home for free, right? As long as I had Wi-Fi, right? It thought I was calling from my house where I wasn't so I could talk to people back home. And now, of course, like you so, said, uh, things like WhatsApp and Skype and all these other things have change that for everybody now yeah yeah absolutely so you know you're you're wisp uh operator you're getting voip curious um what are some of the biggest sort of misunderstandings misconceptions or knowledge gaps uh that you run into when, when someone's really wanting to get into the the voip service game that it's hard yeah, <laughs> that was actually kind of what I'm just talking about. Um, we make it but, easy. But you know, if you don't yeah. know, you don't know, right? And you're like, I don't know. Right. I, yeah. Do I want to be a phone company? And you're like, well, you're not really doing right. the phone company, right? It's Yeah. I mean, in some states, you do have to become a CLAC to offer VoIP. Um, hmm. But in most okay. states, you don't. Um, and if you, you're one of those states where you need to become a CLAC to offer VoIP, if you're thinking about doing fiber you're probably going to have to become a CLAC anyway. So, and usually becoming a CLAC, unless once again, you're in California or I think New York, uh, but definitely California, it's not that hard. Usually in most states become a CLAC. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and I think of the the hard piece, it, it gets divided into regulatory and technical. Yeah. So people are super concerned about the technical aspect, but we do all that. I mean, outside of very basic network troubleshooting, which you have to do for your own internet connections. We're gonna we're we're there for any of the VoIP questions. Doesn't matter how basic it is, we'll help you. That's just all part of the package with us. But the regulatory aspect, though, um, once again, isn't that hard? I mean, if you want to do it yourself, you can. It, it, it's not like you have to have a law degree to do it. Um, the most complicated form uh, gets filed with the FCC once a year. Uh, that's called the four ninety nine. Um, yeah, 499A, the annual one. Um, that's the most complicated form. And and honestly, anyone could probably fill that out. Uh, I, I do think having a consultant do the paperwork is easier, personally. Um, uh, as a business owner, I don't like to be responsible for regulatory filings and having to remember to do them and stuff like that, be it taxes, be it, you know, whatever, right? Uh so I like having someone else that's responsible for it. And there's some really good companies out there that do it. Um, so it doesn't have to be hard. I mean, it, it can be really easy. Uh, and, and that's our goal is just to make it easy. Um, I, other than that, I mean, probably demand. It might be the only other question we sometimes get is, will our customers buy this? You know, is this something that we need to promote? Uh, they quickly find out yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, almost any ISP that has actually started advertising it, put it on their website, start talking about it, use the flyers that we give them, uh, they almost immediately see up to a 20% take rate in their, their, their ISP. And 
the the cool thing about VoIP is that it's really high margin. Um, even factoring in hiring uh, a regulatory person, you get thirty or forty people of VoIP, and you're making good money. Um, like, and it's it's reoccurring revenue right on top of your internet service. And theoretically, you'll never hear from them on that. I mean, you're you're more likely to probably hear from them, especially residential, on streaming video than you will on VoIP. Yeah. Uh, this just tends to be my experience. So, um, you know, those are, those are kind of all like great things about it. And uh, as long as you don't get stuck into some like big contracts or something, um, we don't do contracts or term commitments, We're trying to make things simple once again. So uh, there's definitely ways to dip your toes into it and, uh, and grow and see what happens. Um, but that's probably the only other major thing I could think of yeah. uh, when when I do calls and stuff is, you know, will people buy it? Is the regulatory hard? Is the technical stuff hard? Yeah. Uh, and it, it, none of it has to be hard. It, it can be really easy. It definitely seems like it's almost, yeah. Now that you mentioned it, it's definitely a no brainer as far as making extra revenue. I mean, right. I mean, what's, what's a, a residential home phone plan, VoIP plan, cost these days, like 19, 20 bucks or something like that, 25 bucks. I mean, obviously it depends on what the WISP wants to charge. But like mm -hmm. you said, I mean, honestly, I never use my phone. I pay twenty four ninety nine a month, right? And I never use it. Actually, when it rings, it pisses me off, right? So, so I, I silence it. It literally is there for me for the safety aspect that if I have to do dial 911 or some convenience or something like that. So never really thought about when Wisps these days are fighting and they're selling, you know, 24 30 $40 packages, like 50% of that, you know, could be increased margin just by selling uh, a phone service that you know, a lot yeah. of people need and never really, really use. And you won't know it's broke until you use it. And, and most people use their cell phones, right? So right. That's, that's a huge selling point that I never really thought about you know, offering VoIP uh, as a WISP. Yeah, and in, in 25, you know, 2499 is actually what I usually tell WISPs when they, they say, what do I sell it for? That's actually the price I usually give yeah. uh, because it, it is kind of the market for VoIP. Um, we do have some that charge up to 40 or 50 bucks for it because they're in like some very rural area and the telephone company charges an arm and a leg. They're like, yep. well, telephone company charges it. I could charge it too. Uh, I mean, in business stuff, we don't have any different charges for business or residential. But so businesses, I mean, easily 30 bucks a line and that stuff adds up quick. I mean, it hit and you know, that hopefully we'll never call you too. I mean, that's, that could be a big part of it. So. Yeah. I mean, it seems like an easy 10 to 30% increase in margin right there. I mean, who wouldn't want that, you know, for a service they almost never have to worry about, you know? Yeah. It's, it's definitely, uh, the margin's a lot better than, than some other products that you can add on top of. Uh, to your internet Good way service. of saying it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Charge for email addresses. So, um, <laughs> but, I mean, <laughs> wait, wait, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, everyone's like, this is awful. But, but no, it's, it's a super important consideration because everyone's like, well, I want to do triple play. I want to do like video, right? I'm going to make all this money off video yes. without realizing. I mean, just ignoring the technical aspect of all that traffic on your network. I mean, you've got to worry about your content providers and like even the big providers are always in spats, you know, Spectrum is yeah. mad at ABC or Disney or whatever else. So like, it seems the, uh, the regulatory and the, the marketplace is a lot more stable and there's just a lot less, uh, pain factor than trying to do some of these ancillary services. Oh yeah. And IPTV, I can, I, I could probably write a book. I feel like about how complicated and painful it is. Um, what a lot of people probably don't remember, I hope, uh, the, the, probably the first year we were in business, uh, I told everybody like, hey, we're launching with VoIP. We know VoIP, et cetera. It's going to take us a little bit longer, but we're going to offer IPTV as well. Um, and there's definitely been IPTV providers that have kind of come and gone from the WIF scene. And, yeah. Uh, you know, so and I, I didn't want to be in a position where I'm like kind of in this like gray area with some of them um that have come and gone uh where it's like you don't really have the content rights there or, 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 and then one day uh we can't do it anymore right um 
so I spent a good year and a half, probably the first uh, first year and a half of this company, probably spending too much time working on IPTV. And uh, at best, it's a loss leader. I mean, that's really where it comes into, you know, you offer that triple play. It's the loss leader uh, for your voice and your internet service. Um, and at the end of the day, I couldn't justify bringing the product to market um, just because of how painful it was to implement, how painful it was to get the content rights. I mean, that in of itself was a nightmare um, to do it correctly. So, yeah, I mean, I, I've always been a big fan of things that do add revenue, like uh, managed Wi-Fi. I, I, I'll tell every ISP, man, if you're not doing managed Wi-Fi, you're missing something. Like you should be doing it. But VoIP is another easy one. Like it, it plug a box into the router. Uh, yeah, there's some regulatory stuff, but that can be made easy. And, and then it could be, yeah, an extra 25 bucks a month just, just coming in because you have a little box connected, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, that's part of the reason why I think the companies continue to grow and be successful is after the CAF 2 and art off, you know, I, I guess maybe I had even a little concern like, well, without there being some big motivator by the FCC for which to sign up, uh, will they, you know, will they continue to grow with it, sign up? And um, yeah, uh, it, it's consistent every month, you know, that we've got new ISPs coming in um, and some of the ones that have been with us the longest, it's amazing how much they've grown with us. Uh, so it, it really can be a lucrative market for sure. Cool. Very cool. Very cool. So, uh, and then I guess kind of wrapping up the void part of the conversation, you know, kind of looking yeah. into the future as, as much as a fool's errand as that can be like, you know, do you see any, any big shifts in the, the market or like, you know, governmental overstep, which they're always fond of, or, you know, what, what's looking for, yeah. what's exciting, what's scary, or, you know, does it seem like it should be relatively status quo for a while? Do you think of and I can't think of anything. I, it, I'm, I'm looking forward to 2025 where there is a requirement that you offer 24 hours of battery backup with a voice service. Hey. Um, it, it's kind of a stupid re little regulatory thing that the, the telephone company has got the FCC to do. So you uh -huh. have to offer at the time of sale 24 hours of battery backup. But there's a requirement that your network have any battery backup or... <laughs> Anything else, right? <laughs> but you have to offer it for the ATA and the phone and, and whatever. Uh, typically, what people do is they just make up a really expensive price for something and say, you don't want this anyway. So, you know, here you go. Initially here. Uh, that's why I tell people to do generally. 12 hours is far more reasonable and it's, you know, 100 bucks a battery backup. Okay, I get that. Um, otherwise, from a regulatory standpoint, there's nothing on the horizon I'm aware of that will really affect uh, the VoIP aspect, of, or especially for ISPs. Um, a lot of the big stuff that was going to affect it is kind of already happened. So Stir Shaken was a big disruption uh. in the market. Uh, there is still some regulation coming around Stir Shaken down the pipe for uh, analog circuits, uh, out of band Stir Shaken is what it's called. And if you're not familiar with stir shaking, it's basically a way to authenticate phone calls. So uh, when you receive a phone call, uh, you know that the person calling you actually um, has the rights to use that telephone number. So it's supposed to get rid of number spoofing. Yeah, robocalling is supposed to impact a lot. Um, I think it has to some extent. Um, you know, if on your cell phone you see like a little check mark next to a call, yeah. that means that um, that the call has been authenticated, that it is that person. Um, adding in, you know, as far as like a features type set goes, you also see it on cell phones where uh, they tell you like it's potentially a robocall or a stamp call or fraudulent. Yep. Um, that was a big feature ad that we kind of did the same time with Stir Shaken. Um, and we did that way before it was required. Yeah. About that. Yeah. I mean, but if regulatory, I don't really see anything from a technology standpoint. Um, there's going to continue to be a melding of, uh, the communications into everything that you do. Uh, so, uh, your VoIP service, your phone service also being part of your teams, Microsoft teams experience. Uh, so you've probably seen some of that out there potentially, um, things getting more integrated with your cell phone and, and just other aspects of stuff you're using. 
uh, to make the phone calls easier. Uh, I think that's going to continue that trend. Um, but the, uh, the technology has matured quite a bit. So yeah. new features, like new, exciting things, uh, it doesn't, stuff doesn't seem to get announced every day. Like, you know, I, it, like there always is with radios and other things <laughs> I still follow and enjoy. Um, not as much new things uh, with VoIP, but um, yeah, I think just optimizing the experience, you know, on the handsets too, the waste canceling has gotten really, really good. Um, yeah. That used to not be a thing. And, and now, um, you know, building these like wall, theoretical sonic walls around you so you can be on speakerphone, but the call center noise gets all drowned out and you can't hear it. Uh, there's a lot of kind of cool stuff there and in meeting rooms. That seems to be a big place where uh, companies are spending a lot. Uh, video integration is probably going to be something that gets much more attention than it has today. Uh, I don't know when, but I, I know that's coming. Uh, for us, we're also looking at, so we also do software development on top of just using NetSapiens. We're looking at trying to integrate the AI like everybody else is, right? Yeah. So have the system be able to predict to do things a little bit more when somebody calls in. Um, you know, when you call in and you, and you say something to the computer about who you're trying to reach, you know, it's it's looking at keywords, but there's a lot that could be done with AI yeah. there. Um, so I, I think there's going to be new things like that that will make it the whole experience just smoother and cleaner. Um, but it's not going to be any one thing. It's, it's, it's hard to see for me. Um, because a lot of the predictions I've seen people make haven't panned out <laughs> per se. So right. uh, that's a good thing about mature technology, I guess. Exactly. I mean, honestly, it not being exciting can be actually quite exciting because especially yeah. with the amount of drama and turmoil that's in various, you know, everything going on, you know, in these marketplaces and stuff, it's good to have something that, you know, should be relatively status quo for the, for the upcoming future. And then new stuff will be sort of organic growth or add on or stuff like that. Yeah. So no, that's, that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. Yeah. this says uh, store shaking was a, was a big disruptor. A lot of people weren't ready for, uh, for, you know, various reasons or didn't have systems that were capable of doing it. I could tell you I beat my head against the wall so many times while we were trying to implement it ourselves mm -hmm. uh, because it was the technology was like just catching up with where the regulation was and, and where the dates were and, and the cutoffs were like, well, the system can't really do this yet, but it needs to do it in three months. Uh, uh, is this going to happen? Um, so I, I, I feel like there's like a collective just relief right now of people just like, oh, we don't need to do anything for a little yeah. bit. Like that was, that was a big, uh, a big and, and needed, uh, up, you know, update to kind of telephony, I yeah. think in general. So yeah. when, when are they going to have the do not call list again? Well, so that still exists. Uh, the question is how effective is yeah, it? Yeah. It just um, didn't work. Yeah. I, you know, I think just made you feel better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, Ultimately, stir shake it ends up being the answer to that. Yeah. So the problem with a lot of those do not call lists was you get a call and then you complain about it, but it was some like fly by night night organization. There was no way to track down who it is. Yeah. Um, there's actually already been some some really big fines from the FCC on stir shake it, uh, where people were authenticating their calls. But the, the best part is that now you can point to the carriers that actually have all this bad traffic. Mm. So there was a lot of known bad actors out there that they were the ones signing up all these companies that were doing the robocalls and everything else. Like that was their bread and butter. Well, with Stir Shaken, the whole call path is authenticated. So you know exactly where that call came from. Yeah. And, uh, and that's now allowing the FCC to start doing some uh, some fines. Uh, they've actually cut off some providers from being able to actually put calls onto the network, uh, which is cool. I've noticed, uh, I definitely noticed a downtick. It's definitely got uh, reduced how much how many spam risk calls I get on my my mobile phone. Like I said, the house phone rings all day. I just I turn the ringer off. Right. So, cause it's all, I mean, yeah. even, even in my office and this is a pain in the ass, even my office phone, it's like, 
the phone rings all day and it's it's some telemarketer or something like that so it's like it's annoying uh you know for that that kind of stuff yeah the systems are getting better so yeah. uh reputation analysis is how you kind of figure out the an inbound phone call if it is likely to be telemarketers or robocalls or stuff so there's there's all these different databases the telephone companies use uh, we use a service from a company called TransNexus. Uh, and it, it's just like trying to rate like IP addresses to say like, hey, there's a lot of bad traffic from this IP yes, address. Right. Let's dynamically add it to your firewall. Well, that's where those spam things are coming from. Like the, there's just bad phone calls coming. They're getting reported um, on your cell phone. You know how you can now like identify text messages that, like, hey, this is a spam text message, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of that type of stuff going on. Uh, and I think that stuff's going to continue to get better. I mean, will it get to the point where you never get a call? Probably not, but uh, it's getting a lot better. So I, I hope that whole framework gets better. And there, there's probably some regulation from the FCC that could ha happen there that could help. But I, uh, I'm all for it. I don't want the I don't want those calls on my network either because every time they call you and it's just a junk call pissing you off, costs me money. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, that's true. Yeah, you know, I don't want the, that traffic either. So yeah. hopefully, uh, hopefully we, that gets better over time. Yeah, usually not a, a big fan of government oversight or, or involvement in a lot of different things, but this is definitely one of the areas where I'm like, can we not just like blow some of these places up or something? <laughs> like burn down can, the data centers and yeah, you can tread yeah. on, tread on me, Daddy, just a little bit for this one particular topic because these people are driving me insane. So yeah, yeah. and it's it. It is kind of funny as an ISP, right? You, you don't want regulation. That's how this the whole WIS space even exists, right? It was deregulation and and opening things up. I mean, deregulation happened in this fluffy world in the '80s, right? Where the Ma Bell and got broken up, and some of that stuff that enables VoIP to exist today. But voice has such a longer history of regulation behind it. Makes kind of the state stuff kind of in sales tax and whatever else that that stuff a little annoying to me um but it also does mean that all of the players you know companies like us telephone companies the the voip innovations the bandwidth.coms of the world whatever we're all used to regulation and and know it's just kind of part of it um so when when the fcc wants to maybe do something it's maybe not as big of a shock and I think there is a little bit more buy-in, especially on like Sir Shake it. There was a lot of concern about implementing it um, and, and how that was going to work and, and whatever. But I don't think anyone's really against it. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, can we get rid of robocalls and, <laughs> and spam calls? Whatever? Yeah, I think everybody wants that, you know? So, uh, you know, the, the sausage, it's always ugly how it gets made. But I think uh, that is a great example. Actually, where the FCC, I think, did a lot of good. Um, they listed all the stakeholders. Uh, we participated in in some of those filings. We we filed some stuff, um, and I was actually been pretty happy how everything's turned out. So cool, yeah, very cool, very cool. Um, well, that covers most of the VoIP stuff. I mean, there's a lot of questions I didn't even know I had. So uh, I think that part's been super informative. <laughs> Um, if you want, we can talk a little bit about WISPA, uh, mainly because the WISPA America show coming up here shortly, yeah. uh, Oklahoma yes. city. So first time it's been there as far as I know. So, you know, we're looking forward to it. We're, we're getting all of our bits and pieces together and everything. Um, so, we're you know, you were, you know, y'all will be there. You've been coming there for years. Uh, you've got a lot of oh, experience yeah. with, uh, the WISPA stuff, obviously, you know, being on the board and stuff a lot, you know, uh, what's your, you know, it, it's funny, like, we're like, okay, what's the sales pitch for the show and Wispa in general? Because you would think people are like, you know, have heard these messages and it's uh, ad nauseum the same stuff. But like, I mean, there were posts on Wisp Talk, you know, yesterday that were literally, hey, yeah. what is this show? Should I check it out or whatever? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, for Wisp America, what does it mean? What does it mean for you guys as a vendor? And what does it mean for, you know, your sort of personal experience, I guess? Will you start? Me start. Yeah. Well, you've been to, I feel like, all the Wispa shows. <laughs> been to most of them, yeah. Uh, I mean, as a vendor, uh, it's honestly, it's still the only shows we do is the Wispa shows. Um, 
we've talked about doing other shows, but the ones we've done, we never get the same bang for the buck. And I'm, I'm sure it's likewise for you guys. I know 100%. I'm sure you reached out and, you know, it, it, the, the Wispa shows are just great. Um, and I, I've always loved them. I've loved the community that's around them. I, uh, you know, I, I can't stress enough how much, especially if you're new, how much you're going to learn. Right. Uh, we need more days. <laughs> yeah. I, there, there's one constant for me and it doesn't matter how many of these shows I attend as a vendor, as a, or, or as an attendee is I don't have enough time uh, to talk to everybody, to network, to go to the sessions, to learn, uh, to spend time in the exhibit hall. Like I- I'm always running around like a chicken with my head cut off. I know you guys are too, just like trying to meet everybody and trying to talk to people and, and see things and do things. Uh, and I think that's where, for me, the value has always been. Um, I could tell you from the WISPA side, the shows are significant as far as generating the revenue to uh, really take action in DC. Um, you know, the, the shows are, are, uh, are the moneymaker and, um, and it, it, they do a lot of really good stuff with it in DC. And um, I, I just love what Wisp has become. I mean, I, I remember the first Wisp of Palooza. I don't know if you guys were at it at Flamingo. Mm-hmm. Do you guys remember that? Were you yep. there? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was just, you know, a small room, right? You know, there's 20 booths or something in there. And, uh, now it's hundreds of vendors and, uh, you know, thousands of attendees and, you know, WISP as an organization now has a lot of really good people fighting the battle every day in DC for us. Um, so shows are just amazing. I, I can't tell anybody not to attend. They're, they're awesome. Best shows. Like I tell everybody go, like there's so much value for, for ISPs to go to that, like just meeting people like the, not just the sessions and meeting all the vendors and talking to everybody, but like the little talks that you have after the sessions or yep. during the the happy hours or, you know, late at night, like those bonds that last forever. We're one big family, I feel like. And everybody wants to help everybody. It's a completely different vibe than any other, you know, company industry that I've ever been part of. So I love it. So everybody to go. So, and I'm looking for those little brown first time attendees. I always make a big deal about that. I love it. I'm like, come back. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Bring a good pair of shoes. Yes. Drink lots of water. uh, Be prepared for some long nights. Right. Well, very cool. Very cool. Well, guys, I think that about wraps it up. Uh, Toss us anything else you want to cover or any other. No, that's it. Why don't you, uh, let us know where people can find you, Daniel. Uh, yeah, so uh, you can find Ethereal. Uh, we're on Facebook um, at Ethereal Rocks, E T H E R A L. Um, find us online at Ethereal.com or, or give us a call. Our phone number is 702 470 2770. Always happy to chat just about anything uh i i just love talking to wisps and, and helping out any way i can so even if it's not void i tell yeah. people that all the time i'm like any question yeah yeah that's a big thing for me and, and, and thank you guys for letting us uh join you today um because we really love what you guys do and uh trying to spread knowledge out there so appreciate awesome. it well thanks for joining us yeah thanks yeah. for sure toss those people looking for us as always where can they find us yeah, you can find us all over social media as well. All the uh, popular WISP groups on Facebook, Instagram, and of course, uh, on our website, rfelements.com. All right, all right. Well, until next time, everyone, uh, y'all be good, and we will talk to you guys later. Later. See ya. Thanks. <laughs>